Yeah, hello to everybody, and thanks very much to Albert Lee Seeds that to invite me to this meeting today. You have to bear over with me, I'm not a native English speaker, so my native language is Danish, but I hope you can understand me. Otherwise, finger in the air, and then I'll try to explain better if uh, there's something you do not understand. Um, KWS is a very old breeding company, uh, more than 150 years, it's German, and uh, all the first years right up to the 90s, uh, they were only working uh, for the German market. Since then, we have been uh, working in many other countries and uh, try to be worldwide. We are about 5,000 people working in the company and uh, only focusing on breeding. So, uh, and in terms of marketing, we always work with partners all around where we want to be active. And um, only last year, it was decided in the company to introduce hybrid rye into US. We, we started a couple of years in Canada and uh, was quite successful from the beginning. And therefore, we decided also to introduce this crop into US. We know it's not going to be easy. <laughs> uh, and we also uh, are 100% aware that we need to have the whole chain along. We need to ensure the marketing uh, for the grain we are producing. So my presentation will not be so much about cover crop, uh, although it was quite interesting to listen to the discussion before, because uh, the region that I'm coming from, uh, there's no discussion at all. We have just been forced to have at least 60% of all our land needs to be uh, with a cover in the winter. It doesn't matter which kind of cover, but it needs to be covered. And it was 20 years uh, since it was decided. And it was de uh, decided because we found some dead fish in the sea, and uh, they said it was due to the leaks of nitrogen from the agriculture. And, and therefore, we have been through many different environment uh, uh, laws and uh, uh, how can I say protection. And um, the cover crop is one of those who has helped us the most. So it's not wrong what has been said today. It can really help, and uh, it can also ensure that you keep the nitrogen in the soil so you don't uh, uh, miss anything at the end. And you can actually also keep the yield and the, the income on farm. So that's by experience for my region. You shouldn't be that afraid, although it's not easy to make the change. But anyway, hybrid rye, as I said, I want to try to say if somebody of you dare to test uh, uh, and grow it uh, next year, uh, then my presentation will focus uh, first on uh, some practical issues you have to be aware of if you want to grow this crop. And the other thing is really uh, the marketing afterwards. And my experience, what has been successful in our driving of the hybrid rye in Europe, uh, how to get, uh, get it, uh, the whole chain to accept it, where to use it afterwards. And therefore, it's also good that the milling industry is here today because there's also a lot of, uh, of uh, uses in, in the food industry. Anyway, here uh, we see the, the first hybrid was developed in, uh, in the 86 in Germany. Uh, it's so that uh, hybrid rye is a pure, it's a 100% uh, cross-pollinating crop, so it's easy to produce a, a, a true hybrid like you do in corn. And we use exactly the same technology, both in, in breeding and also in production. So uh, there's no big difference there. And the first was developed in 86 and uh, made commercial in Germany. The only problem in the first decade was that uh, the restorer was not uh, really good in the breeding, so uh, we had a lot of uh, yield potential, a lot of uh, yield increase, but there was also a lot of ergot. And I can tell you the milling industry, that's something they don't want. It's a funty uh, in the year. Uh, so uh, step two in the development of the hybrids, it was to focus on uh, to find the right restorer. And KWS invested a lot of money to, to get that uh, uh, improved and uh, they managed uh, by 2005 the first pollen plus variety was launched into the market and ever since uh, we ha had the chance to only focus on, on yield improvement and 
So the yield has been improved uh, the whole way through and still are improved in the hybrids. And if you follow up the, uh, the red line down here, you see that's uh, improvement, the breeding improvement in the population rise. Also what you see here in the uh, in US, uh, the population rise hasn't improved in yield since the 70s. So there's a, a great potential. And uh, we did some uh, tests during 2016, and this is what I could manage to, to, to put together in, uh, of the yields just to show you the potential in the different trials we did around in the US. And uh, it's small plot trials, all of it. There's only a couple here, which is on farmer scale. But um, you can see around in this area, there's a, a pretty nice potential, and I'm pretty sure Oh, okay, but uh, if you go in this region here, we are, uh, this is bushels per, per acre, 122, uh, 100 for, from a farmer uh, who had tested it, and over here on the other side of the lakes, we are uh, close to 140 bushels, but I'm pretty sure that with the good soil and the fertility you have in the soils here, we can get even above 140, and if I compare well, what we do in, uh, in Europe, we are close to 190 bushels uh, per acre. And I, I think it's a matter of learning how to grow this crop and how to, to manage it in the rotation you already have. So, but this is one thing. The other thing is also to use it in the end. We have something, uh, we, we need to find uh, buyers for the crop. But there's a lot of potential. And uh, we continue all the trials uh, also this year, and we have also a lot more farmers uh, trials coming up for, for next year. Um, some of the practical things which we need to uh, find out much more about, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's about uh, the, the different um, characteristics, which is very important when we grow it to, to meet the, the highest potential. And one of them is actually, when do we have to, to, to seed the hybrid rye? And that will be different from region to region. And um, uh, what is important is to, to get a good uh, establishment in the, uh, in the autumn. Uh, and it means that the crop has time enough to develop a good root system and to, uh, to develop the tillers which are going to, uh, to carry a year, the year after. We don't want the tillers to de be developed in spring. It has to be developed in autumn uh, because that's where we get the good years and the good grains. So this is something we need to find out. I guess it's some, somewhere in between, for this region, somewhere in between mid-September to mid-October. But we have to find the exact, because it also has to do with the seeding rate. Seeds are very expensive. I guess you know from the corn, when we are talking about hybrids, we are not as expensive, but it's expensive. And we want to use as low seeding rate as possible. Uh, and uh, because of that, we also have to find out exactly uh, when, when to uh, put it in the ground. Um, so, uh, as I said before, uh, it's a hybrid and uh, hybrid has a fantastic ability to uh, develop the root system and also to develop uh, uh, the tillers uh, in autumn if it really uh, gets the time for it. And um, uh, in comparison to wheat, we often see that uh, wheat is, if it's put in the ground early, it just grows up. And quite often also because we use higher seeding rates, so there's competition to plants uh, which are growing beside. Whereas a rye, a hybrid rye, we want to have as slow seeding rate as possible uh, with a good distribution between the, uh, the plants. So it gets the ability to, uh, to really chill in autumn and, uh, and also to develop the root system. And uh, regarding the root system, there will be a, s a slide uh, afterwards because uh, hybrid rye is really the crop who is developing enormous root system which is also a part of the, how can I say, uh, what the proper cover crop should do to catch uh, the leaching uh, nitrogen. So what we say is that about f four to 10 tillers in the autumn, depending on the fertility in the soil, but I guess here, 
where you have a fantastic soil fertility, uh, we should aim to have the highest amount of tillers in autumn. So it could be in average six to eight. Uh, and these are those who are going to uh, develop the, the big ear uh, uh, and, and the good grains the year after. But it means we have to hit the correct uh, seeding time and the correct seeding rate. And the seeding rate I'll also come into later. Root system, this has been done many research. I took uh, just one from Germany, who uh, has been looking at, uh, uh, that was the only one where I could compare with corn, because corn is a big crop in this area. But as you see here, the root, uh, root length and also uh, the, the amount of roots per, per square or per cubic centimeter is enormous in the hybrid rye in comparison to the other crops you have here in the region. So this is very important uh, also when you have the discussion about uh, cover crop if, uh, and the efficiency from the cover, uh, cover crop that you know that the root system here is, is really big. Um, Another thing which is also important, uh, I could understand on the barley, that you have problems with the winter kill. And uh, in the rye, uh, we know that the uh, winter hardiness is fantastic. We grow rye far north in Canada, and it survives every year. We grow it uh, far north and far east in Russia, in Finland, and it's the only crop who is actually surviving the winter every year. So I have no uh, doubt that it won't be a problem with winter hardiness here. What could be a problem, and that's why, again, back to the practice, how we establish the crop, is that we want a lot of tillers in the autumn, but we don't want too much foliar. Uh, because if it gets too, too dense and, and too much foliar, too much biomass before the winter, and I think this is also what you saw in the barley trials, then you also have a, uh, a tendency that snow mold can kill the crop. And this is also something that is affecting rye. So, so this is something we have to bear in mind when we, when we decide for the seeding rate and, and so on. But, but, also, but snow mold can be treated with a fungicide in autumn. But I know that this is maybe not what we aim for, but it can be done if the, the foliar is too big before the winter. Um, rye is the crop which is growing on a very low temperature, so it means it's growing long time in the winter until the fr first frost is starting. And uh, it's also the crop which starts very early in spring. And this means that uh, in practice we have to be aware of that when we fertilize the crop. The, the, all the uh, nutrients has to be there when it starts regrowth in spring. So it means nitrogen not only, but also the phosphorus and the potassium needs to be there because it grows extremely fast in spring. Um, so, and water demand, you discussed about water demand. The water demand due to the, the deep root system is not as big as it is uh, for the other crops we're dealing with. So 20% lower demand for nitrogen and water in comparison to the other crops. Seeding rate means a lot because it's a, it's a, you know, rye is a fairly tall, and especially the old population rye is fairly tall. Rye, uh, hybrid rye is not that tall, but you see my colleague, uh, she's not as tall as me, but she's uh, nearly uh, covered in the, in the crop. But uh, by the seeding rate, we can also uh, take off uh, some of the height of the crop, 10 to, 10, uh, 10 to uh, 15 centimeters. We can take off how much is that in inches. I haven't learned that yet, but <laughs> I have to, I guess. Uh, um, but anyway, it, it looks maybe good this here because it looks dense and so on. And this less dense is half the seeding rate. But there's some risk of having too high seeding rate. It's, we have increased the uh, plant height uh, and uh, we, we get very thin straw. Uh, they get very weak because they, they, if it's too dense, they compete against each other, get too long and too weak. So this is uh, a risk of lodging. And uh, what we also know is that the ears get smaller and the grains get smaller. And this is something we don't, do not want, uh, either for the milling or for the feed industry. Um, so this is also something we have to focus a lot on in the next couple of years when we are doing our trials here. 
both in practice and in small plot, to find the right seeding rate. And uh, again, it has to be low, and it also helps your economy uh, when you're buying the seed. Um, um, drilling is very important. Uh, I normally say that the rye is a small grain and even smaller than wheat and barley quite often. And uh, I normally say it has a small lunch, lunch packet alone. So therefore, you have to be very careful with the seeding depth. Uh, we, it's a hybrid. We, we need to get it up as quick as possible so we uh, develop some green leaves and uh, grow on that. Um, so. Uh, we, we aim to 0.8 uh, inch in seeding depth and um, the double is too much and on the surface it's also not very good. Um, we, we don't know exactly why but uh, a, a grain from rye uh, just or a seed from rye just uh, left on top of the, uh, the soil. If you get 10, uh, 10 millimeters of rain afterwards and, and bad conditions after the, this will never be a good plant, never. So when we are using low seeding rates, it's very, very important that all seeds are coming into the uh, right conditions in order uh, to be uh, correctly developed afterwards. We did a lot of trials uh, during 13 and 14, nine trials with seeding depth. And it's very clear, the deeper you go, uh, the, the lower yield you get at the end. You get fewer tillers, which can produce fewer tillers, tillers in the autumn, which can produce the good ears, and this is very important. Um, also, when we are talking down to point, uh, point, uh, six point eight unit per, per acre, uh, what uh, what we use the seeding rate, that means six hundred thousand uh, plants per, per acre. That's not a lot. It's really, uh, it's not much then we have to be sure that all grain are placed exactly right. Exactly like we do with, uh, you know, those who are working with vegetable seeds or with sugar beets and so on. They are also doing a lot of job to make sure that it's placed correctly. And we have to do the same here with hybrid rye. And quite often some of the new sewing machines or drilling machines, they, they require a high speed. And this is not always the best when we are the planting uh, hybrid rye. But, but bear that in mind, this is very important because this kind of distribution of seeds with low seeding rates is no, no way uh, where you get the high potential when you are going to harvest it. Here we need a very uh, much better distribution uh, of the plants. And we have done a lot of uh, research on that. So. We, we said, what does it mean if we are sowing single seed like they do with sugar beet, for example? So we, we set up such a sowing machine which could do the single seed. And um, this is how it looks like when we go really down in seeding rate. But it's really possible. If you can make a good distribution, you can go extremely low in seeding rate. And it looks very good with the single seed sowing. And here it's with the conventional. And um, yeah, this is just after uh, the winter. And again, here you see with the different uh, seeding rates per square meter. Sorry, it's not per square foot, but, but anyway, um, it uh, turned into unit per acre. It's uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and 1. Um, you see the yield difference between the single seed uh, sowing and the conventional. And here, of course, we have to you have a high yield here, yes, but the economic uh, high yield when you take the cost of the seeds and so on into, uh, into account, then of course we are with the highest yield here if we can make a, a, a very good distribution of the seeds. So it means between 0.6 and 0.8 uh, unit uh, per acre will possibly be the optimal here in the region. And then it's, it's also not too bad with the uh, that you have to buy the seeds every year. Um, Ergot is, or you, as I said in the beginning of the hybrid uh, development, it was a big problem with Ergot. And this is something we have to prevent. Nobody wants these Ergots. Uh, beforehand we cleaned them away and sold them to the medical industry and the, they made headache pills. But today they do that 
in a different way, so they don't want it anymore. So we have to make sure we do not produce them in the field. And um, uh, as I said, we developed the first Pollen Plus hybrid back in uh, 2005. And um, this system is working extremely well. But you have to follow the, uh, the recommendation we give you in terms of uh, uh, practice. So it means all the things with the seeding and so that you get an evil development in the field. You also get an even uh, flowering in the field. And this is the crucial thing, that all plants are at the same stage as flowering. Because our hybrids are restored 100%, so they produce enough pollen to make sure that we don't get the ergot. But if you get different timing on the flowering, because you have done something wrong, then you have a problem. You can have a problem with ergot. And one of the worst thing we see is actually, I don't know how you do it here. I have to learn that too. But we, we do make it one or two spray in, in, uh, in, in the hybrid rye. And we use tracks in Europe uh, to drive in when we do the spray. And um, just very simple, uh, make sure that these tracks are wide enough so you do not uh, destroy or uh, touch any of the plants so they get later in the development because every time you touch or you drive over plants here which is in the middle of the track then they get uh, set back and they get uh, flowering later and then and maybe they get not as tall and and then when they flower there might be uh, might not be pollen and all and we we have observed we have done a lot of tests on that and Actually, 90% of all ergot is normally coming from the tracks. And uh, sometimes we actually uh, recommend the farmers not to harvest the tracks, but do it afterwards and use it for something else. OK, uh, fertilization, I said you have to be early. Uh, and here, uh, I forgot to say in one of the former slides that in terms of um, nitrogen, uh, normally it's 20% less uh, nitrogen as we uh, recommend per um, per pound or per hundred pound that you you want to that, that you expect to harvest it is 20 percent less that you put in your calculation of needed nitrogen as for wheat so so this is important and also important that you in your calculation when you uh, uh, have to figure out how much nitrogen you want to give the crop you also have to bear in mind how much is in the soil from the former crop. And this has to be taken off, the total amount. So total amount of nitrogen for a hybrid rye is really much lower than a wheat. And this is really important to take into account. Also because if you add too much and it, it gets too good conditions, uh, then uh, lodging is, uh, can be a big problem. So uh, I would say either all the nitrogen out on a very early stage uh, and if there's not much left from the former crop in terms of nitrogen you can split it in two but every time you split it then it's also extra cost extra manpower uh, and so on um, it has to be used somewhere and we are fully aware of that and we did a, we have done a lot of job in europe also uh, during the last two, three decades uh, to work with the feed industry, the food industry, in order to make sure that, that uh, we can also sell the products we are producing. Because hybrid rye, or rye in, in totally, was also really much down back in, uh, back in the 90s. Uh, but now it has come back because uh, it has such a high potential in comparison to the other uh, small grain uh, cereals and even corn in some regions. So for the feeding, I'm just giving some examples where we use it in, in Europe. Here, um, uh, feeding animals, uh, there's sows, there's piglets, there's a hawk, uh, I think you call it hawk production or slaughter pigs. There's uh, dairy cows. We make a special product for the dairy cows, very cheap and e extremely uh, effective. And then uh, grazing is also an option. Uh, a lot of uh, biomass production can be done and at the same time double cropping. So it means it can be uh, actually combined here if, if you have cattle or cows, that you can make a silos and then uh, a corn uh, afterwards. And then 
we have a lot of biogas in Europe, so we use a lot of uh, uh, silage for the biogas. Um, uh, feeding hogs. Um, uh, I come from Denmark, and uh, in Denmark we have five times as many pigs as we have people. So we, we, we spend a lot of time on making recipes for, for hogs to make sure that we get rid of all what we produce in the country. So um, the menu, the, this is about productivity. And uh, there we are more focused on which kind of grain we are using. And you talked about oats, I think you have to be a little bit careful but because uh, uh, hog producers, uh, oats is not very valuable. The energy level in uh, oats is very low in comparison to wheat, rye. Uh, products, so this is something you have to bear in mind. There's uh, economy, of course, uh, all feed mills they will be uh, looking at the economy. Feed is uh, as cheap as feed sources uh, and also availability, they want to have it uh, available all the time. And this is a big problem, introducing a new crop into a, a region to make sure that there's enough for the feed uh, mills uh, uh, every day. And then animal health, this has become one of the biggest issues during the, uh, I would say, the last 10 years. Not only for human beings, but also for especially hog producers. We are not allowed to use any kind of antibiotics pre-mixed uh, pre in, in, uh, in the feed anymore. And I'm pretty sure this is on the way also to the US. And it will, when it has started, it will come very quickly. As well as you heard for the glyphosate, I can tell you, during the last two years, all the big dealers, or all the big traders in Hamburg, which are also ADM and so on, they are not buying any malting barley from 2016, which has been uh, pre-treated uh, or pre-harvest treated with glyphosate. And it's going so fast you won't believe it. And that will all come here. And the same with antibiotics, I'm pretty sure. So this is also something which is important. Uh, animal uh, and health is very much related to, to fiber. And uh, without doubt, we have a crop with the highest amount of fiber here. Um, and this kind of fiber has now shown during a lot of research that it has a lot of health, uh, uh, um, health, um, uh, how can you say, health, yeah. And um, one of them is this, uh, oops, I went a bit too fast. One of this is uh, this uh, 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 Albino Sulana, which is uh, in the pencil sands. And this is uh, uh, it's just some starts, which is very difficult to break down in the normal uh, stomach, in the, in the stomach, in the uh, small intestine. And uh, it passes very slow through. But what it does, it, um, it, it, it shows that, that it has, a, uh, when we look at the uh, hog production, it has a, a, an effect on a lower feed use, and this is, this is positive, it's an economy, uh, maybe a lower uh, gain, but on the, on the other hand, at the end, it, has a, it gives a higher lean meat, uh, and this is very important uh, in many countries that the lean meat is high because they pay more for that. Um, then also, um, it, you know, when you feed as you do here, with so much corn as you do, uh, you have difficulties on the export market, maybe not locally because you're used to this kind of fat that you produce on the uh, hogs when you use 100% corn. But on the export market, they want f firm meat, firm uh, fat, and you cannot do that with 100% corn. There you need uh, to go maximum 60% corn of the cereal part of the uh, feed mix, so here, a rye will fit extremely well, and this is also where we have been uh, uh, very um, successful to bring it in, in the feed mixtures in Europe. Um, and also, in the, uh, by the south, uh, that when they get more and more fiber, they get much more uh, relaxed, and this is a very important uh, factor, has shown to be a very important factor in terms of productivity. Actually, we get more live-born pigs uh, from a sow, which gets uh, uh, much higher uh, fiber content as we, what we use to give them. And this is uh, 
at the end. We have many farmers that have more than uh, 35 uh, piglets uh, per, per year per sow, and this is, this is quite good. Uh, and then improve health. And health, what is it? This is back to these uh, Albino Sulana, which is uh, actually a probiotic uh, uh, compound. Because when it goes past through the intestine and comes to, uh, to the bowel syndrome, it's, uh, it's been transferred into these fatty acids, which are actually food for the bacteria in the, in the uh, uh, gut. And this is very important that our whole gut system is uh, working 100%. So this is, counts the same for a uh, for human being. So therefore, uh, this is something seen. Uh, more and more also for the hog producers and uh, it can uh, it can reduce in uh, quite considerable uh, the use of antibiotic uh, for ferro fever and this is this is not only important for the sow but also for the piglets because antibiotic has a negative effect on the bacteria in the go uh, in the gut so this is uh, something which is maybe not 100% new, but it's something which are used very much in practice in, uh, in Europe. And I think this could also be used here. And, uh, and the hog production is quite big here nearby. Um, so the recommendation around Europe today is that we can go to 50% of the feed mix of the cereal part, taking, and this is about 60% of the total mix, 50% of that could be rye. Uh, for the sows, uh, for the end uh, of the finishers uh, from 88 pounds and upwards 40% of rye and it really increases the, the lean meat which is very important in the export market um, and also it, it's, it's really uh, make a better production economy. Um, and then for the small ones where you need a, a quick growth and, uh, and, and maybe more energy uh, per, per, per pound of feed mix you give them of maximum 20%. So there, there is a market here, but we have to develop it. We have to convince the feed mills that this is really not uh, just something they have to take because you produce it, but it's some uh, which gives, gives a benefit uh, for the whole chain. Um, if you look at wheat and corn, they have a high energy level and rise just below. Uh, triticale the same and sometimes uh, we are uh, adding some uh, 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 sulanase, some uh, enzymes in order to digest some of these fiber a little bit more than what we normally can. Uh, it seems that there, there is some which has some effect on that and economic also has some effect but there's a lot of uh, job done there from the enzyme producers but that's something uh, which always can be added. Back to what also was said just before in terms of um, uh, fusarium toxins. Uh, I disagree <laughs> with what was said. Uh, rice really one of the cereal crops with the lowest infection of uh, fusarium. It doesn't matter where we are. And old is actually some of the worst one if you come to some parts of Canada, some parts of northern Scandinavia. It's, uh, it's, really, uh, it's really a big problem. Uh, here we have done a lot of research on it from South Germany where we have a really wet con continental climate where we every year has a very high uh, pressure of fusarium to produce uh, done. And uh, here we are every year below uh, the limit for, uh, for, for feed is uh, one and uh, I mean, how is it? I can't remember exactly what the limit is, but we are far below the wheat. And um, so this should not be the biggest concern, also not here. There's another thing which is very important uh, today. Uh, phosphorus is a very, very uh, expensive uh, to add to the, to the feedstuffs. And uh, it gets more and more expensive because there is limits to uh, availability of it. But we have a whole lot of phosphorus sitting in the plants which we do not really utilize 100%. We can do it by adding enzymes, but the best enzymes is actually those which are in the plant themselves. And um, 
if we look at the different crops, they have phytase inside. And here we see that rye is, is a crop which actually has an extremely high phytase activity. So it, it means with using the rye in the mixture, you have a natural phytase activity where you actually can, by 40, up to 40% of rye in a mixture, then you can actually leave out the, uh, the enzymes uh, uh, or the synthetic enzymes, which today are added to all kinds of feedstuffs. So this is also a, a point which makes rye interesting. And there's some uh, different uh, in terms of uh, varieties, but that's something we are testing for the, uh, uh, for the varieties every year. Um, then feeding cattle and cows. There is uh, also uh, uh, something we have worked very much in. And um, what is deciding what we are pull putting into the mixture is, of course, uh, high silage yield uh, and quality per acre. That's clear. Uh, and local production as close to the, uh, to the dairy as possible. Um, and then what is available of cheap uh, byproducts. And then filling factor, how much can the, you actually f uh, fill in the cow? And, and how much energy can you fill in? And then bypass starch, uh, how can you boost the milk production? Uh, and then health again. And uh, here, just some examples how we do use hybrid rye in, uh, in many parts of Europe. We have this possibility of uh, green silage. And, uh, and this is... Uh, uh, quality, of course, depends on the harvesting time. I guess you know all that. Um, early cut before here before uh, ear comes out. Ear should not be that far out, it should be still inside. Then you can produce a, a very high quality uh, protein uh, crop uh, for, for the dairy cows as, as a, a mixture together with the uh, corn silage. Uh, later cut, uh, on the milky stage, you have the highest biomass production uh, and this is more for the cattle or uh, for the pregnant cows or what you call them. <laughs> Uh, or for, for their empty period, or, yeah. And then uh, also, uh, but, but in general it works very much like feeding with grass solids. And then you have the double cropping uh, possibility. For uh, normally here, uh, in our condition, and I guess it will be about the same here, you will be harvesting or cutting this uh, green uh, stuff around the end of April. So you have time to, to drill a corn afterwards. So that could be a, a, a part of the, uh, how can you say, cover crop uh, development in the region for, for, for the dairy, cows, uh, dairy farmers at least. Um, but even with the, with the late uh, at heading, because it grows so fast that you can wait until milking stage and then afterwards also drill a, a short cycle corn. Um, we have done just one single trial last year, but this year we are, I think we have 10 trials going on which are going to be harvested in 2017 here in the US. But just to show that we, we can actually uh, beat, uh, here, that was in Pennsylvania, we can beat um, the triticale used already in the region. So, uh, and this is actually with Brasetto, it's just a grain variety. And next year we have our progress, which is a silage variety, which is producing much more biomass. So I think it will be no problems to, to, to beat uh, the triticale you knew. There was also a point here, uh, if you use it, it can be grazed also, of course. But there was a, uh, something about allelopathy. Uh, it means that rye here, uh, and the more roots you have on rye, the more they produce of these exudates, which are, uh, how can I say, kind of herbicides against many wheat. And uh, uh, the only thing I know, uh, and we have observed, is that those seeds who are getting close to the roots of rye from any wheat has difficulties to grow. And there's differences between the, the types of wheat. But, and I think red clover, if you put it down, beside the roots of the, uh, the rye, it will also have difficulties to so I would, I would suggest red clover in rye should be spread on top of the soil uh, early spring and not incorporated uh, to the soil.
because then it might be that uh, uh, it will be, have difficulties to germinate. But here you see the difference between it was drilled the same time. Here triticale, a lot of wheat inside, and here you have rye. Of course, it's hybrid rye, so it's also developed much more folio, much quicker than triticale. But but it also has uh, uh, there's no wheat in here, and this is uh, on an uh, organic farm. So. Um, uh, uh, we call it soda uh, uh, corn. Uh, it's, it's actually very simple. It's just uh, the, the rye grain. Uh, it's uh, used by a lot of dairy farmers to boost the milk production. It's uh, just the grain into the mixture, then 3% uh, of, uh, of uh, nature uh, hydroxide into it, and then water. And then you mix it and you put it out on the floor and then you use how many pounds you want per cow per day. Uh, onto the uh, uh, corn silage and grass silage, whatever you have in the mixture. And here you can actually, th this works as a bypass starch, uh, and uh, it bypasses simply the ruminant before it's being digested. And we all know that when, it, when you can move some of the digestion into the small intestine uh, and the hen gut, then, then you have a higher milk production. So this is, and you can go up fairly high in terms of pound per cow per day, even with a high uh, uh, corn silence uh, portion. So this is uh, simple, it's cheap, and it, it works very well. This is just a table how to mix. This is an uh, example how it looks like when it has been treated. It's like, uh, yeah, it's really basic. And the effect is that yeah, it goes through the without being digested and uh, not affecting the pH in the ruminant. And it can be stored up to three weeks, uh, so they can make a whole lot uh, at a time and then uh, use it every day. I won't go into detail. Then food, of course. We, we, we know that uh, this is also a very important, and especially when we're looking at the health, uh, because we know that that uh, rye grain is the healthiest grain we can eat. Uh, and we have all these companies and we try to get in contact in order to, to make sure that they want to buy our uh, grain. Um, and there's a whole lot of products, which can, there's from chips and burger, any kind of breads, there's these. Now you were talking about uh, oat meal. Uh, this is a growing market enormous growing market which is taking over from the old uh, to produce these uh, flax of, uh, from uh, uh, bo uh, both coarse and the fine from, uh, from, uh, from rye and also uh, pottage. Uh, uh, it's uh, very uh, a growing market also. And then of course the morning cereals uh, and any kind of uh, these uh, snake board. Uh, and then, of course, whiskey. We don't forget, more and more whiskey is produced from rye. And, and they are actually uh, winning every year now, uh, the best whiskey. Um, again, we have been through that. There's a, a positive on health, I won't. Uh, one thing is uh, important, again, this is uh, this probiotic uh, profile it has. This is comes from the fructines. The fructines is really what is so uh, important for our uh, whole uh, gut system. So, and this is so much higher in rye than in all the others. So this is again why uh, this health and, and, and why uh, rye could fit more into uh, the food. Um, well, um, research has been done. It's of course, uh, there's a lot of uh, fiber effect uh, for the overweight. Um, there's uh, actually research being done that um, with rye, uh, a certain amount per day, many of the diabetes 2 uh, patients can work without getting uh, pills every day if they eat a certain amount of rye, uh, fiber. So it's quite interesting. There's about cholesterol. It's also due to the fiber and so on and so on. Uh, it's, there's a lot of things going on here and um, I hope that the food uh, uh, sector will help to bring that along so we can. So a lot of, of possibilities for hogs, for dairies, 
for cattle, for grazing, for biogas, uh, and then milling and beverage. So, thank you very much. That was. I don't know if there's any questions. Yeah. yeah the question I have: you, you discussed a lot about the uh, bushels per acre. It looks like it's a lot higher than what we're used to here with, with the varieties that we have. How would you control tonnage if you're chopping tides? Because we do a lot of that here. Is it going to be a significantly higher tons per acre of silage than rye and rye or the ones that we work with? For sure, it will be because. Uh, You'll see that when you when you come out and uh, look in the trials that the the, the growth and the, the f uh, how can I say the tillering really. yeah the tillering uh, it's it's so huge and the foliar uh, development in in early spring is so much more than uh, the other uh, yeah, old not, population rises. It's at, the, the varieties that I saw like the Brasetto, which we sold some of this last fall um, it's actually a shorter ride than what we're used to but much more profuse tillering, lots more leaf matter, so a lot more valuable forage, less stem, more leaf. Yeah. And quicker, also. This is also very important, especially if you want to have it as uh, a double cropping system. And there we have the, actually the new rice coming progress. It's much quicker in spring. So. One more question here. What about some like fat and cattle? Fattening cattle. Fattening cattle. I thought this question was coming, but, and this is something we have to do a lot of more research here locally because we, you know, like you do here in the U.S. and Canada and with all the feedlots and so on, we do not have them really in where I'm coming from. So I have no big experience on that, but I can't see why it shouldn't be uh, why it should uh, be possible. Uh, to use, uh, you use a lot of barley. Uh, I know that in Canada, a lot of barley is being used, and you have a high energy value in the rye, and you have the, more or less the same kind of fiber content. So I think, um, uh, why not? But we have to do a lot of tests, and we will do. It's already uh, ongoing. We we have a big product going on in Canada where we have already produced uh, thousands of tons uh, for, for the feedlots. They're the both uh, on the silage part, but also on the grain. Yeah. Any more questions? One more. If it's too hard to dry, does that mean we can't take the seed and plant it the second time? No way. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hybrid. And you, are, you won't get any good out of it, I can tell you. It's, it's a rubbish what you get out of that. Because uh, if you see the mother and the father line when we produce it, they are so diverse. And, and you know, the segregation after uh, uh, F1 is terrible. But, but as a cover crop, you really wouldn't want it to go to seed anyway. Yeah, but you're not allowed to. You're not allowed. No. I think that we're kind of run out of time, so yeah. we'll stop there. Thank you, Claude. Yeah, okay.